Uh, good morning again and welcome. My name is Andrew Lane. I'm Vice President for Alumni Relations and Development at VLS. And I am thrilled to be with you all this morning for this important talk. Uh, as a reminder, unless you are asking a question when we get to Q&A or speaking up here at the podium, please remain masked at all times. So, so pleased to <laughs> welcome you to the annual State of VLS Address, during which you will hear an update on the school and the vision for the road ahead. We will leave ample time for questions at the end of the presentations. And please also note that this event is being recorded and will be shared uh, online for swans who can't be with us here in person today. Uh, before kicking things off, I want to acknowledge two very important people in the audience, VLS Board Chair Glenn Berger, Class of 78, and VLS Alumni Association President Jacqueline Brilling, Class of 79. Glenn and Jackie, a thousand thank yous for your service. This morning's first speaker is Beth McCormick, a graduate of the University of Chicago and the Boston University School of Law. Beth joined the VLS faculty in 2011 and later served as Vice Dean for Academic Affairs and then Vice Dean for Students. In January 2021, the Board of Trustees named Beth Interim President and Dean, a position she relinquishes to become Interim Dean of the Law School next week. It is my great pleasure to call her my boss and my friend, and I turn the podium over to her now. Good morning. Let me just hear from this group. How many JD alums do I have? Great, and how about master's alums? Joint degrees? Great, well welcome home to Vermont Law School. It's such a joy to have our first in-person commencement since 2019, and I'm really excited to share with you everything that's been happening at Vermont Law School in the last few years. I like to start all important meetings at Vermont Law School by reading our mission statement, so I'd like to do that now. Our mission is to educate students in a diverse community that fosters personal growth and then enables them to attain outstanding professional skills and high ethical values with which to serve as lawyers and environmental and other professionals in an increasingly technological and interdependent global society. I took over as interim president and dean in January of 2020. And when Tom McHenry stepped down, we had a lot of challenges facing us. One thing that I learned from our HR director was to look at challenges and problems with the rule of seven. And it sounds really simple, but it's really helped me gain perspective on the problems that we're facing. So it goes like this. Are the problems that we're facing going to be problems in seven minutes, seven hours, seven days, seven months, seven years, or 70 years? And that really helped me assess where we were when I took over as interim president and dean. Unfortunately, a lot of the problems we were facing at the time seemed to be of the seven-year variety. We had just come off the restructuring and we're still recovering from the negative press associated and the reputational hits that we took as a result of the restructuring. We were in the middle of a global pandemic. We were in fully remote operations at the time, trying to get back on campus, but completely hamstrung by the six-foot social distancing rule given our classroom space. We also, as an independent law school, didn't have the services of a health center or scientists on call to help us figure out how to safely bring our students back to campus. We had just started a strategic planning process and we were in a divisive discussion about whether to re relocate the campus to Burlington. We were reeling from bar passage issues, having had the 2019 first time bar passage rate surprisingly drop 22 points from where we had been in 2018. We were facing major accreditation work over the next year. We had our once every 10 year ABA inspection coming up that had been delayed during the pandemic. And we also faced a five year investigation by our NECHI, our regional accreditor, accreditor, the New England Commission on Higher Education. It seemed like a lot of those problems were seven year problems, maybe even 70 year problems. But thanks to the leadership of the board and the work of the senior leadership team, 
I think we've stabilized the school and I'm really excited to announce the accomplishments that we've made and our plans for the strategic direction of the school. I want to first acknowledge some of my mem the members of my senior leadership team who are here today. Not everyone is here today, but Lorraine Atwood is our Vice President of Finance, Jenny Rushlow, our Interim Dean of the Graduate School and Director of the Environmental Programs, and <laughs> Stephanie Clark, our Director for the Center for Justice Reform, and our newest member, Lisa Ryan, our Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. For those of you that hear Lisa's title, don't worry, Dean Shirley Jefferson is still here, and you'll hear from her later today, um, and she's still very much part of Vermont Law School. With that, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the problems that we've faced and, and overcome in some ways in the last um, 18 months, or 17 months, three weeks, and one day. <laughs> I'm going to start, this is the agenda I have planned for us today, and I know there's lots of time as well for questions at the end. I'm going to talk about admissions and bar passage. I'm going to talk about employment outcomes for the JD class of 2021, COVID response. I'm going to talk a little bit about finances, of course, the strategic plan. I'm going to show you a video that really highlights the main features of the strategic plan. And I'm going to highlight some key events from the last six months, some key events in the next several months, and then about four areas that the law school and the graduate school really need to watch in the coming months and years. And then again, of course, there'll be time for questions. So let me start with bar passage. One of the reasons I was interested in taking the interim dean, president and dean position is I had been working a lot on bar passage as the vice dean for students for many years. And I knew it was a critical area for us to solve our bar passage issues. To give you a little context about what happened, we had around 2017 convened a group on student success who devised about 40 suggestions to improve student performance and bar passage. And we'd implemented quite a few of them around the time that the 2019 bar passage results were coming out. Now with bar passage, whatever you do really takes three or four years to see the fruits of because whatever you do for the curriculum, the JDs come in, but then they don't take the bar for three years and then you don't get the results for another six months. So there can be a lag time. But in 2018, our bar passage, first time, went up eight points from where it had been in 2017. In 2017, the first time bar passage had been 60%. 2018, it was closer to 70, around 68.9. And so we had expected, as some of these things that we had done were starting to gain traction, to see an even higher increase for the first time bar passage rate in the class of 2019. And unfortunately, we didn't. We saw a 45.6 first time bar passage rate, which was devastating. And it was a similarly profiled class to what we had in 2018. So we really had to do a lot of analysis to figure out what had happened and what we can do to fix it. Right around the same time, the ABA passed a new bar passage regulation that was retroactive. So the new regulation, Standard 316, didn't care so much about first time bar passage rate and really focused on ultimate bar passage rate. It required schools to have a 75% ultimate bar passage rate. They measured that within two years of graduation, which is four opportunities to take the bar. So if a student graduates in 2019, they have four chances to pass the bar for us to count them as a pass to achieve that 75%. If they take it once and fail, we have to count them as a fail. If they never take it, we don't count them at all. If they take it four times and fail, and succeed on the fifth time, we count them as a fail for ultimate bar passage rate. I'm only talking about how the ABA looks at bar passage rate. It's not how we look at it. We want everyone to pass regardless of when and as soon as possible. But I'm focusing really on how the ABA calculates bar passage. So this is where we are right now. Our ultimate bar passage rate for 2018 was 82.84%. We were able to improve on that 45% that I told you about to 67.54 after the four opportunities. And this improvement is actually remarkable when you consider that two of those opportunities for the class of 2019 were right in the heart of the pandemic, which for anyone that knows was an absolute hellish time for bar takers, for everyone, but also for, especially for bar takers who had no libraries to study in, who had to take the exam remotely with no scrap paper, if you can imagine. Um, and had to, the restrictions were so tight that if anyone walked into a room, 
while you were taking the bar, pass it, the bar online, you automatically failed. So it was a very difficult time for those bar takers, but still we were able to achieve our, to improve our ultimate bar passage rate to 67.54. I have that in red though, because that does not pass ABA standard 316. So we are out of compliance for bar passage for the class of 2019. The standard gives you two years to get back in compliance. So two years, and what's most important is what the next class does. And so if you are able to get to 75% for the next class, then you cure your violation of standard 316 and you're good to go. So this hasn't been officially reported yet because the time to report to the ABA has not happened, but I am pleased to report that the 2020 bar passage rate is 66.8, and so we're back in compliance and no longer Sorry, 76.8, so we're no longer at risk for violation of standard 316 from the class of 2019. Now, we still have to keep an eye on this, right? Because 2021, where we are right now, is 63.4%. Most of those students still have two more opportunities to pass the bar, um, but that's lower than we wanna be. We made a ton of changes after the 2019 bar passage resu results. We made changes at the curricular level, we made significant changes in admissions, we made changes in our support for bar students. We made changes in our support for students that were unsuccessful passing the bar the first time. Um, it's hard to tell what's working or not at this point, but our 2021 results are still 63.4. One of the reasons that I'm really excited that uh, incoming President Rodney is joining us is that I know that he has had tremendous success, success at his uh, prior institution at improving ultimate bar passage rate, even though his first time bar passage rate was very similar to ours. His ultimate has outperformed us. So we have an opportunity to learn from Rodney here. I also love that Rodney took the bar recently. How many years ago? Yeah. Seven years ago. So um, to have the perspective of a professional like Rodney sitting to take the bar and telling our students what a difficult task it is, I think will be really important to changing the culture of bar passage around here. I mentioned that one of the things that we did differently was change our admission standards to make sure that the students we admitted had the best possible chance of passing the bar based on long-standing studies about um, undergraduate GPA and LSAT and how they predict bar passage success. We still tried to keep a holistic view of admissions and not unfairly out, um, only look at LSAT, but we did change and, and heighten our admissions criteria to make sure that we, our students would have success. Of course, you won't see that until the class of 2023's bar passage results, because by the time we knew about the 2019 problem, the classes of 2020, 21, and 22 were already in the building. So the first time that you'll see uh, the, the change in credentials will be for the graduating class of 2023. I'm pleased to report that our admissions targets are completely on target for the, for the incoming class of 2023. We had estimated about 150 JD students, and we are exceeding that at this point. As we always say in the admissions world, we don't really count them until we see the butts in the seat in September, but the indications are good. Our master's admissions are on target, a little bit behind, although we tend to see a lot of master's admissions in July, so nothing to be concerned about yet. But I think you'll see as you hear about our strategic plan, that part of our strategic plan is designed to elevate those master's programs, to improve admissions in those master's programs, and to make sure that the world knows about the master's programs that we have to offer. And you'll hear more about that in a moment. Wanted to also talk to you about employment outcomes for the JD class of 2021. Good news here, we improved 81% overall employed or in a degree program, which is up 4% from the class of 2020. These numbers are particularly impressive given the pandemic. And Abby Armstrong continues to lead our career services department. And she reports, this is what we reported to the ABA. We had 41% in law firms, 15 in business, 18 in government, 10 in public interest, 15 in clerkships, 1% in higher education. And 26% of our graduates from the class of 2020 are doing environmental or energy related work. Wanted to talk to you a little bit about the pandemic. So, as I mentioned earlier, the pandemic was a very difficult time for an independent law school with few resources and not so much space. But we were able to manage very well with a year, well, 18 months really, of virtual operations, one full class year 
we had fully virtual operations um, using the platform teams. I was incredibly impressed by the way our faculty rose to the occasion to deliver quality hybrid online education during the pandemic with little notice. And I think that's the result of our longtime leadership in online education as we had had and offered online classes at the law school for about 10 years at that point. It was also a credit to our IT department that provided a lot of support to some of the faculty that might not have been so technically advanced, uh, but managed to deliver quality education nonetheless. We were thrilled, though, to welcome, uh, to welcome students back to per in person last August for residential classes. This is a picture of my civil procedure class. Students for most of this year were required to wear masks. Um, and I really am, am proud of our students as well for their compliance and responsibility in keeping the community safe. We decided to have a vaccine and a booster requirement for the community. It was a difficult decision, but one that I made in consultation with other leaders in Vermont and following CDC guidance. We also had a vaccine clinic and a booster clinic right here on campus. We had right in the lower parking lot near the library, we had um, all, both Moderna and Pfizer come in and provide boosters to anyone that wanted it. We provided on-site testing two days a week. So we contracted with Broad Laboratories in Boston, and two times a week, anyone in the community who wanted to could come to get tested, and they received their results normally in less than 24 hours. The combination of these efforts kept our community really safe as we returned to residential operations. We barely had any minor, we, we had one, quite one slight in, um, increase in positive cases right around January. But generally speaking, we kept our numbers quite low and I was really impressed and proud of our community for doing so well during the pandemic. And now I wanna to talk to you about strategic plan because that's what we've really been working on for the last two years at the law school. And when I talk about the strategic plan, I really want to make sure you know what a collaborative effort this plan was. This plan involved input from trustees, faculty, staff, students, and alums. I think it's our collective best work. We spent thousands of hours working on the strategic plan, and it's built around our strengths in environmental law and restorative justice. And I'm going to give you the highlights of the strategic plan right now, and I'm going to show you a video that really further highlights um, what the strategic plan attempts to do. The strategic plan also enjoyed near unanimous support from those constituencies. So the faculty, staff, and board of trustees voted near unanimously to support the strategic plan. In general, or at a high level, the plan splits the president and dean position and hires a new president. We had to develop, gain approval from the ABA, and implement part-time online hybrid JD program. We changed the structure of the institution so that Vermont Law School and Vermont Graduate School are two schools on equal footing under Vermont Law and Graduate School. I want to make clear, as you all know, we've always had master's programs here. We've always had graduate students here. But now, by having this separate school, this separate graduate school, we really bring attention to our graduate programs so that we're more visible to prospective students, donors, funders, and the world. So the plan builds upon the strengths that we already had. We heard from a lot of master's students that they felt lost a little bit being in a law school, and that they felt at times that they had trouble even finding us when they were looking for a master's program to go to. So those were the thoughts that really led to us to develop the strategic plan that we did. We're also developing and launching an advocacy center. We learned that to really train students to solve the world's most pressing problems, and by that I'm talking about climate change and the need for justice reform, the students really need training in multiple disciplines, law, policy, advocacy, leadership. And our advocacy center and our graduate school attempts to be able to provide that training. We also work to expand our presence in Burlington I want to be clear that we're no longer considering a full campus move to Burlington, but we do want to have an expanded presence in Burlington so that we can better partner with the other institutions in Burlington, that we can be more visible to all of the undergraduates that are in Burlington, and that we can take advantages of everything that Burlington has to offer as the most diverse city in Vermont and as the city with the most amenities. So that's why our hybrid JD program's residency will be hosted in our Burlington space. 
And then our strategic plan also contemplates fundraising, fundraising tied to the 50th anniversary of Vermont Law School and the strategic planning implementation. So now I'd like to show you a video that really describes in a bit more detail the strategic plan. And then I'm going to ask um, Dean Jenny Rushlow, the interim dean of our graduate school, to talk to you a little bit about the new degrees that are already developed. The world faces a daunting series of complex challenges. Climate change, social inequities, racial injustice, just to name a few. Overcoming these challenges requires bold action, creative thinking, and new approaches. Those attributes are at the heart of a forward-looking strategic plan that will redefine the way Vermont Law School interacts with the world and propel it into a new chapter of excellence and impact. Designed by faculty and staff and adopted by the Board of Trustees, the plan transforms Vermont Law School from a law school to a graduate institution, provides the structure it requires to achieve unhindered programmatic growth, raises the visibility of the master's programs, strengthens the JD program, and appeals to a wider audience of prospective students and donors. Becoming a graduate institution will provide the foundation needed for unhindered programmatic growth, raise the visibility of the master's programs, strengthen the JD program, elevate the school's world-renowned environmental program and first-of-its-kind restorative justice program, and appeal to a wider audience of prospective students and donors. Importantly, the new structure will allow Vermont Law and Graduate School to pursue increased enrollments and maintain the flexibility to more easily add programs and degrees in response to market conditions and enrollment trends. I think that we're seeing a real expansion of what people want to do at a graduate level as professionals. And while having a law degree and a Juris Doctor is instrumental in lots of different fields that people want to go into to practice as an attorney or to be a policymaker, there's all sorts of occupations and professions that, that need a graduate level of training but don't require a JD and it allows students to really specialize. It's never been more important to address the issues facing our country today. Climate change and justice reform and by creating a graduate school we are giving more access to students who can learn the tricks, the trades on how to create law and policy my hope in creating a grad school and a more encompassing program is to increase access to education and knowledge to everyone. Bifurcating what has up to this point been a joint president dean position will allow the president to focus on the higher level strategies and external and internal relationships that are important to the future of the school and the strategic plan itself. Chief among their responsibilities will be securing transformational gifts and championing a comprehensive fundraising campaign. The plan also establishes separate dean positions for both the law and graduate schools. This new structure just reflects what we've long been. So we've always been a graduate school it's just gotten lost in the law school. And so now, by having a separate graduate school with a graduate school dean, and then the law school with the law school dean, and then the president overseeing it all, we're um, going to be an institution that is managed in a way that's similar to other universities that have graduate schools and law schools. In April, the Board of Trustees announced the hiring of experienced leader in higher education and nationally recognized scholar, professor and litigator Rodney Smalla, as Vermont Law and Graduate School's first president. The board also extended Beth McCormick's term as interim law school dean and named Jennifer Rushlow interim dean of the new graduate school. Both will serve in those roles through the 22-23 academic year while national searches are conducted. Changes to the school's master's degree offerings, including three new degrees focused on climate change, environmental justice, animal protection and equity, will enhance the rigor of the school's master's programs, provide greater relevancy and value to today's students and respond to the world's most pressing needs. The new degrees are a Master of Climate and Environmental Policy, residential and online, Executive Master of Environmental Policy, online only, and Master of Animal Protection Policy, residential and online. 
These new degrees are public policy degrees and feature a robust set of core and environmental policy courses. I'm really proud that we're going to be offering such a rigorous policy education so that when students come to our school, their policy degree rivals the best public policy schools out there, plus the benefit of being keenly focused on what drives them to do this work, which is the environment, animal protection, climate, environmental justice, restorative justice, these areas of public interest and social justice where we really shine. This new curriculum, aspects of which will also be added to the existing Master of Energy Regulation and Law and Master of Food and Agricultural Law Policy degrees, will produce graduates with increased practical skills and enhanced career prospects. Beginning with its first class this fall, the new part-time online hybrid JD program will allow working professionals to earn a law degree while earning an income from anywhere in the country, all while offering the same rigorous legal education as the residential JD. Delivered through a mixture of online classes and three brief in-person residential sessions, the online hybrid JD will offer students the opportunity to specialize in environmental law, food and agricultural law, energy law, or restorative justice. I'm really excited about the online hybrid JD program. It's our first part-time program ever, and so it really increases access of Vermont Law School to a whole new population of students in ways that make me really excited. The program is unique in that there aren't many other online hybrid JD programs with ABA accredited law schools, but what makes it even more unique is that it focuses on environmental law and justice reform, which are our two specialties. And so I love that this program builds upon our many years as being leaders in online education, strengthened during the pandemic, and opens up Vermont Law School, its professors, its classes, to a whole new population of students. Basing the program at the school's Burlington facility leverages the city's proximity to the largest legal and student communities in Vermont, as well as the convenience of being near an airport and ample hotel options. Vermont Law and Graduate School was created to shine in this moment, and the alignment of its strengths with the world's focus on the climate crisis and justice reform puts it in an extraordinary position to affect change. We're at a time in world history in which everyone on this planet desperately needs a solution to climate change, and we're at a time when all of our institutions are tested with regard to their commitment to social justice and the rule of law. Never in the world's history has the Vermont Law and Graduate School meant more to society in this state, in this country, and across the globe than it means right now. I'm not going to... Um introduce Jenny Rushlow, our Interim Dean of the Graduate School and the Director of the Environmental Programs to give a little bit more information about the new environmental degrees. Yes, so we're, we're very excited. We've been working really hard on developing these new environmental degrees. VLS was the first law school to have a master's degree that was accredited by the American Bar Association. And we've continued to be at the forefront of delivering education to master's students in that space. But as you know, those of you who are practicing in this area, this is a very dynamic field. And while we used to be the only one, there are a lot of other people at the table now. And so we need to be really thoughtful about what makes our degrees unique, what attracts students, but also what is environmental policy today? What are the credentials and experiences that students need to have while they're obtaining those degrees? And so this has really been an opportunity to refresh and think about how to enhance and grow this part of our student community. So the biggest change that we're making is that we are retiring the Master's in Environmental Law and Policy and growing instead to have a Master's in Climate and Environmental Policy, which is a 34 credit degree, an environmental policy degree that is, that is really tied to climate change policy and environmental justice at its root. There will be three concentrations if students want to have a concentration, one in climate change, one in environmental justice, and another in ESG. 
and um, a, a big change for that degree from the MELP is that there will be a pretty solid base of core requirements around public policy skills. So if you went to a school like the Kennedy School and got a public policy degree, you would see that there's a number of core courses, economics, quantitative analysis, these kind of hard hitting things that you really need to be a policymaker that we haven't offered in the past. That's gonna be required now. So this will be a really um, rigorous public policy degree, but unique from some place like the Kennedy School because everything will be infused with what really motivates students to come here, which is their passion and commitment for the issues for environmentalism. And students out there who want to do this work now, they care about climate change. That's what's bringing students to VLS to do environmental work now. I taught air pollution last year. I had to convince all the people who came to school here to do climate change, why they also needed to care about air pollution. Um, so that's what brings people in the door, and that's what environmental law and policy looks like these days. Um, we're also offering a 34 credit animal protection policy degree, and if you have any questions about animal policy and what that means, we have a fantastic new professor, Delcy Winders, who's gonna be at the barbecue later, who we snatched from Lewis and Clark, um, who has already built a world-class animal law and policy program here. Um, and then a new thing we're doing is we're gonna offer a degree online, the Executive Masters in Environmental Policy. We're not aware of anybody else that does this. It's a 25 credit degree, which is shorter than our closest competitor, Lewis and Clark, um, for mid-career professionals. So while our 34 credit policy degree is a longer experience, more likely to be attractive to students who are um, perhaps a little closer to graduating from college and want that residential experience, the executive masters is online for people who are working, they have a job promotion they're trying to get, they want to shift focus in their career, they're taking these classes around caring for their families or going to work, um, and we're valuing that professional experience that they have coming in by allowing them to obtain a degree with fewer credits. Um, we think that degree is gonna be very popular, and so we're really looking forward to the enrollment benefits from that. Um, and so those are the new degrees. We're gonna continue to have our energy masters, continue to have our food and ag masters, but all of those degrees, new and old, are gonna benefit from that rigorous core curriculum that I mentioned that will allow us to rival the best public policy schools out there. I'll turn it back to Beth. And then further good news is I told you that the faculty, staff, and board of trustees and alumni were supportive of our plan, but we also got an external endorsement of the plan when we recently received an $8 million anonymous gift to support the environmental program and our strategic planning initiatives. So that puts us in a good position to get this plan launched and implemented. It doesn't get us all the way there. We still have work to do, both in the fundraising area and, of course, with the plan implementation. But it's a good step and a real boost that the external audience is as excited by our plan as we are. So I think I'll leave on that note, um, and I will, in, I will introduce you to the incoming president of Vermont Law and Graduate School, Rodney Smola. Thanks, Beth, and welcome, everybody. It's a delight to... Um, meet you in person and see you. Um, I go by Rod, I'm informal, low maintenance, and so you should feel free to pick up the phone or text me or email me at any point if you wanna talk about anything. And I say that to the folks that will watch this remotely uh, because we're filming this, uh, uh, extend the same invitation to them. Uh, you saw that one of the key elements of the new strategic plan is the splitting with a division of labor between the deans and the other leaders that we have here on the campus and the president. And you saw three of our outstanding leaders uh, already this morning. You saw Stephanie talk about the uh, Restorative Justice Center on the film, and you've just heard Jenny and Beth give you updates on the graduate school and the law school. Uh, but as form follows function, I'm gonna be a little more philosophical with you uh, as I reflect with you on the past and the present and the future of the Vermont Law School. And I'm gonna talk to you about three what I will call poetic tensions. 
Now, I think real poets probably would say my use of poetic tension is not really good English, but I've adopted the phrase to describe what I observe in life and in institutions and in our society when I see us as individuals or as organizations or as a society trying to mediate and reconcile tensions not between good and evil, not between good things and bad things, there's plenty of those in our lives, but between good and good. And a large part of our experience as a country, a large part of our experience in the legal profession, as a large part of our experience in public policy, is somehow mediating and reconciling and striking the correct balance between good things that pull us in opposite directions. And so I'll talk about three of those as they apply to the school. And as I do that, I'm going to inject a little interlude, because I can't help myself, uh, reflecting about some of the poetic tensions in the United States Constitution and our constitutional experience, because I think they have an impact on the way we think and operate as a society, the way we operate in higher education, the way we operate at America's law and graduate schools. So here are the three tensions, and then I'll go into them a little more deeply. The first is the never-ending tug and pull between fidelity to a plan and the need to be adaptive as you execute, execute the plan going forward. And as elegant and as positive and as convincing as our strategic plan is, I'm going to talk to you in, I hope, a comforting way about the inevitability of the need for adaptation as we work through it experientially. Secondly, I'm going to talk about a classic human and organizational tension between what we think about in terms of our brand and our reputation, our concern for how the world sees us, as opposed to some of our own inner authentic convictions and values in which we care more about that than necessarily how they would be perceived externally. It's an ongoing part of the human condition. It's part of the everything we do in life. It'll be part of the future of this school. And finally, suggesting what you heard from Jenny and from Beth, I want to reflect a little bit on the study and practice of law and the study and the practice of public policy and how they are alike and how they are different how, and how they synergetically inform one another. But first, a little interlude. Constitutional law. Now, you didn't come here for a constitutional law lecture or CLE credit. <laughs> But I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the patterns of thought that I think inform our constitutional history and how they spill over into the way we think about so many other things in life. Quite a long time ago, I coined a phrase called the constitutional unconscious. I was kind of channeling, you know, psychoanalytic theory like Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung and so on. But that fancy title was a mask for a very, very simple idea. And the simple idea is that our constitutional history and our constitutional experience are not just law in the way that courts know law, not law the way you study constitutional law when you take it in law school, but it has a, a deeper resonance in American life. It has influenced our patterns of thought throughout many of our institutions. It has in, in influenced the way we think, the way we, it's the DNA of our country in many, in many ways. And it has had a particularly profound influence on higher education. M my theory about American universities, public and private, is that they were a real break from the European traditions of what a university is. And that break was influenced by our constitutional structure. If you think about it, some of the basic attributes of our Constitution are mirrored very much in the way universities and law schools and graduate schools are organized. We have separation of powers in the Constitution. 
Well, so do we at universities. We have boards, we have presidents, we have faculties, we have students, and they each claim certain rights of sovereignty and certain checks and balances powers on one another. We have notions of federalism in the Constitution, the national power versus the local powers. And that exists in universities. It exists at the Vermont Law and Graduate School, where we may have a central administration, but now two schools and then many sub-programs beneath them. And we have notions of rights, claimants, people that say, I have some independent right here as a faculty member or as a student or as an alumni member. And so those patterns that have kind of created our constitutional experience have seeped over into the organization of American universities. Three of the, or some of the poetic tensions that exist in our constitutional law are particularly important to the Vermont Law and Graduate School as we think about our identity at this critical moment. And I'm gonna first mention the very first one I talked about. So if, if you were to ask me, a student of constitutional law, someone who's taught it for 40 years, litigated in courts across the country, written about it a lot, what I would identify as the defining poetic tension of American constitutional law, it is the central question of whether our principal fidelity and loyalty should be to words written in the Constitution and their application as they were understood at the time of the writing. So, it, so what the framers of the Constitution would have decided about the issue we're dealing with right now or do we interpret the Constitution in a very different way? Sometimes this is caricatured as treating it as a living Constitution. I don't think that does it justice. I think the better way to think of it is to say, the people that wrote these words, the people that created due process of law, the equal protection of the law, freedom of speech, they were enacting principles they were enacting concepts. And they may not have seen the necessary implications, consequences of those concepts in their time in the same way that a future generation might see them. This is sometimes called the idea that a future generation can liquidate the meaning of the principle that was enacted in light of their more recent experience. And that seems like a strange word to use, liquidate. That comes from James Madison, who actually said, I'm not gonna give away my notes from the Philadelphia Convention for 50 years because I want the republic to liquidate the meaning of the Constitution through its own experience. We, of course, saw this classic split in American thinking about the Constitution dramatically and vividly evidenced this week in the two blockbuster decisions the Supreme Court handed down this week. The New York State Rifle Association decision involving the Second Amendment and the overturning of New York's laws restricting the carrying of handguns, and yesterday's decision in the Dobbs case in which the Supreme Court overruled Roe v. Wade and Casey versus Planned Parenthood. Now, I'm not here to talk about the cases. I'm not here to talk about anything other than the fact that although those two cases are topically very different, one's about guns and the other's about abortion, and doctrinally different, one deals with the Second Amendment, another's de dealt with the Due Process Clause, they are jurisprudentially identical because the majority of the court in both cases said, we will interpret these provisions by asking ourselves, what did those folks who wrote the Constitution mean and how would they have applied it back in the day when they wrote it? A little constitutional law, there are two dates you could pick. One would be 1791, when, for example, the Second Amendment was ratified and the first due process clause was ratified. The other would be 1868, when the 14th Amendment was ratified, because the 14th Amendment is technically the vehicle through which we apply the Bill of Rights to the states. More than you need to know. The court didn't have to pick between those dates in these two cases because they said it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter. We are sure that at both times, 
those who wrote these provisions would not have permitted New York to restrict guns in the way New York has done it. And we are sure that both times, those who wrote those provisions would not have treated abortion as a fundamental right. Now, let's contrast that with a different way of approaching the law and a different way of approaching the Constitution. Then my little mini con law lecture will be over and we'll get back. The, the other example that I've already suggested is that you don't look at how those folks who wrote it would have solved the problem. You look at what the larger principle is that they were adopting. And now you, applying that principle in light of current sensibilities, solve the problem. And believe it or not, these two approaches, though we may have now come to think of them as the first approach aligned with conservatives and the second approach aligned with liberals on the Supreme Court, it ain't necessarily so. In fact, over history, conservatives and liberals have, from time to time, been gravitated to each of the two sides. So the notion of looking at the principle probably in our lifetimes was never more famously or significantly adopted than in the Obergefell case, the same sex marriage case, where Justice Kennedy's opinion for the court, Justice Kennedy, a moderate middle of the road conservative, said it is the nature of injustice that we are often not able to perceive it in our own times. He was conjuring the second idea of principle. But interestingly, two very stalwart conservatives on the court have from time to time embraced the principle. Justice Antonin Scalia, the icon of modern conservative jurisprudential thought, and Justice Neil Gorsuch, a more recent appointee on the court, both used the second principle that I've described to reach very progressive results in cases. Justice Scalia, when he was on the court, wrote for the court in a case called Oncali versus Sundowner with this, this question. Does Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which the court had interpreted, includes a prohibition on harassment, racial harassment, sexual harassment? Does it include harassing by an, a superior to a subordinate who are of the same sex? So is male-on-male -male sexual harassment prohibited by Title VII? And Justice Scalia said, I know that the folks that wrote the Civil Rights Act of 1964 never would have dreamed that this would prohibit that sort of discrimination, that sort of harassment. But that's not what governs. What governs is the policy they enacted. What governs is the principle they enacted. And we've held that discrimination includes harassment. And when you discriminate on the basis of gender, even if it may be a male who is, who is harassing a, another male with a sexual come on, that fits the principle. Therefore, it's, it doesn't matter what those who wrote it would have, how, how they would have applied it, this is what it means. And, and more recently, in another very progressive decision, uh, two years ago, in a case in which the court um, was led by Neil Gorsuch, who wrote the opinion of the court. It involved a question that had vexed courts since 1964. Does the prohibition on discrimination based on sex include discrimination based on sexual orientation? So if you discriminate against someone because they are gay or lesbian or transgender, is, is LGBTQ discrimination covered by the Civil Rights Act or not? And for decades, the, le the, the learning had been, it's not. Because what, clearly what they were thinking in 1964 was, you have men and you have women and you have to treat them equally and you can't discriminate between men and women, but that has nothing to do with whether you're gay or lesbian. I look around, I see men, I see women, but I don't know what your sexual orientations are. That's a whole different thing. And my goodness, in 1964, there's no way they intended 
to do anything to protect LGBTQ people. It was a crime to be homosexual in most of the states of the United States. Um, it was unthinkable that that's an application that they had in mind. But Justice Gorsuch, very influential modern conservative, said, does it matter LGBTQ discrimination violates Title VII? And he gave a simple, elegant, mathematical explanation. Some of you may remember there was once a movie called Rocky. More of you would know Rocky III, Rocky IV, Rocky, you know, <laughs> but in Rocky there's this moment when Sylvester Stallone says, it's simple mathematics. You hang around with yo-yos, you're going to be a yo-yo. All right. <laughs> well, Justice Gorsuch basically said it's simple mathematics. He says, look, I'll give you the demonstration. Let's say you have two employees. One is John, one is Mary. They're both married. They both have a sexual relationship. John's partner is named John. Mary's partner is named John. Now the employer says to Mary, you're cool, you keep working for us. Employer says to John, you're not, you're fired. Justice Gorsuch said the two people were in identical situations. The sex of John determined that he was going to be fired. He said all sexual orientation discrimination is automatically sex discrimination. Now, I'm done with the lecture, but notice the elegant point. Conservatives and liberals in this country are both capable of adopting the notion that the principle is more important than the original application. How do we apply this to the new strategic plan? Here's my simple admonition going forward. I think the strategic plan is magnificent. You saw it demonstrated, you saw its highlights. I'm thoroughly convinced I'm thoroughly on board. And I'm not just saying that, because I've already taken the job. <laughs> but it was one of the things that attracted me, that I thought the strategic plan was such a thoughtful roadmap, and I was so impressed by the process. But I know enough to know that we will inevitably have to make adjustments as we live through it and execute. Execution is different. And you know, I've, having been through many strategic plans at many universities, I've sometimes said, sometimes you need a strategic plan to figure out how to execute the strategic plan. And, but it's just life, and we should be OK with that. So I'm an old athlete. You, know, you go into the basketball game or the football game, you got a game plan. But one of the cliches of sports is the interviewer comes at halftime and says, coach, it's not working. What, are you gonna, what adjustments are you going to make at halftime, right? So we will inevitably make adjustments. My own personal plan is that in the next four or five or six weeks, I'm going to dive into every nook and cranny of it. I'm going to talk to everybody concerned. I'm going to try to get a sense of how things are going. I'm very optimistic. I think my diagnosis will be things look very good to me right now. But just as you already heard Beth things, talk about things to watch, things to be thinking about, I'll be doing that. And I want you to be comfortable with that. So you come back a year from now, two years from now, and you hear, we decided to add this, we decided to damp down that. It's OK. It's not a panic. It's normal. Next thing I want to talk about quickly, this other poetic tension, the second one I mentioned, is the difference between reputation or brand and our inner belief structure. In my view, a well-adjusted human and a well-run institution naturally treats both as good and both as important, but has to have some sense of balance between them. So for me, the most beautiful articulation of this split comes from Shakespeare. It comes from Othello. There is a famous speech in Othello in which Iago, who's that wonderfully colorful, kind of manipulative front man, political operator uh, for, for, for Othello and others. He makes this beautiful speech. It's one of the most famous expressions in English of the importance of reputation. And he, he says, reputation, dear my lord, is the immediate jewel of the soul who steals my purse steals trash, tis nothing. Twas mine, twas his, and have been slaves to thousands. But he that filches from me my good name robs me of that which not enriches him, but makes me poor indeed. Wow, 
you could be Shakespeare if you could write like that. What beautiful, beautiful encapsulation of the importance of reputation as the immediate jewel of the soul. But what I love is that several scenes later, in the same play, the same character, Iago, says something dramatically different. He's speaking to Cassius, and Cassius is freaking out because he feels his reputation has been damaged. He's going, reputation, reputation, reputation. And Iago interrupts him and scolds him. And he says, reputation? I thought you'd receive some bodily wound. There is more offense in that than reputation. Reputation is an idle and most false imposition, oft got without merit and lost without deserving. You've lost no reputation at all unless you repute yourself a loser. What a great line that is. How many times have you maybe had to say to your kids, I know you think everybody hates you, but you're not a loser, you're a winner. And I don't want you thinking you're a loser. <laughs> but it captures this beautiful notion that sometimes we do what we do to aggrandize the market, to protect our reputation. It is the jewel of our souls, but we also have to have some faith in who we are as authentic persons. So do we care about our reputation at the Vermont Law and Graduate School? Well, of course. We care about our ranking in environmental law. We care about our ranking in US News and World Report. We care about admissions. We care about donors. And we know that how we are perceived is critical. But at the same time, we never want to lose sight of who we authentically are. The idea that you heard Beth say that now we open every official meeting of the Vermont Law and Graduate School with the reading from the mission statement is a reinforcement of who we are. And you all are the ultimate testimony to who we are, the graduates, the alumni, in this room and watching virtually. The lives you've lived of consequence and meaning, the impact you've had, the service you've done to clients, to public agencies, to others, that it reflects the values that you absorbed here and you carry forward with. I'll end with the final Poetic tension, the tension between the study of law and the study of policy, which you see embodied structurally in the School of Law and the Graduate School. So on this one, I'll just tell you a little war story, because I'm a litigator. I love, I love arguing cases in court, state and federal courts around the country. I'll tell you a quick story uh, about a recent case I argued. You'll see the connection. This happened to be a case in the Supreme Court of Delaware. And I argued it about three weeks ago. Uh, I argued it twice. First, I argued it in front of three Delaware Supreme Court justices. There are five on the court. But then the court decided the issues were too difficult. They wanted to have it reheard with five justices in bank. I argued the case the first time the day after I interviewed for the job here at, on campus at the Vermont Law and Graduate School, I was sweating it out because I knew I had this oral argument scheduled in Delaware. And I had it figured out. I can get to Vermont, I can do the interviews, I can finish, and then I'll drive back to Delaware, and the next morning I'll be at the Delaware Supreme Court. But then somebody told me a little thing called the mud season. <laughs> and, and there was snow on the ground. And I began to think, what would happen if I couldn't get back to Delaware? Well, I was taken off the hook because a week and a half before the argument, the court said, we've had a resurge in COVID. We're going to move the arguments back to, back to Zoom. You can do it remotely. So interviewed here, drove across the river, checked into the Hanover Inn, because they had really good Wi-Fi, <laughs> and, and, and argued the case remotely. Then I was very fortunate to get the position as president. Uh, I, and it, Delaware is a small state like Vermont. You get to know everybody. I knew all of the five Supreme Court justices as well, serve on committees with them, serve on commissions with them, do ceremonial events with them, and so on. So I happened to be at a lunch with the chief justice, Right after I found out, number one, I was going to have to argue this case a second time, and number two, 
that I was coming to Vermont. And I had announced it. And I was the lunch, luncheon partner of the Chief Justice. He was sitting next to me. And he said, well, congratulations. We'll hate to lose you. Congratulations. I'm glad you're going to Vermont. He said, my daughter has two degrees from the Vermont Law School. <laughs> she, she has a JD degree and a master's degree from Vermont Law School. And he says, we used every excuse we possibly could to go visit her. He said, Here's, he gave me a list. You got to go to the Barnard General store. You know, everything, uh, everything you wanted me to see. So that was very gracious. Three weeks later, I'm arguing in front of the Delaware Supreme Court. And of course, now it's a whole different thing. Everybody's got their professional faces on. You disregard all the fact that you know folks. It's totally, totally impersonal and professional. The case was a fascinating intersection of very difficult issues of public policy and very difficult issues of law, First Amendment law, reputation, all these things. And it was a rock'em sock'em argument, the kind I love, and back and forth, back and forth with the first, uh, with, the, with, the, with the appellant's lawyer who was terrific. And then I get up there, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and the justices are zeroing in on this connection between law and policy. And somehow out of, out of, out of my brain, I said, well, your honors, you know, sometimes American life has been best viewed by people from other countries that come here and observe us. And one of the most famous examples is Alexis de Tocqueville, who wrote this famous book in the 19th century called Democracy in America. And he wrote this sentence. He said, scarcely does any political question exist in the United States that does not ultimately become a judicial question. What a truth. I mean, our entire identity as a nation is wrapped up in political debates, like all of the debates we're having this week, which take place in our political forums, in our cultural forums, in our judicial forums. So I did that quote, and the Chief Justice, for a split second, broke character and gave a big smile. And then he went right back to the poker face. Now, may, I think it was probably because he's a student of American literature and American history, he liked the reference. But in my heart, I'd like to think, not what you're thinking, oh, he's going to vote for me. It wouldn't be so crass, all right? But that somehow it was a sort of kind of mission from God, if you remember the Blues Brothers, little whispering that the school's doing the right thing, that it is true that law and policy are indissolubly linked. I know that a lot of folks here and over the generations here have dedicated their lives to justice, to environmental justice, to social justice, to restorative justice, to the idea that we stand for something, stand for something bigger than ourselves. And I hope that will always be the guiding principle. In the words of the prophet, we won't rest until justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness is a mighty stream. Thank you all for having me, take care. Okay, so we have about 20 minutes for questions, and we invite you to raise whatever it might be that's on your mind. If you would like to lob your question to Beth, that's fine, or to Rod, that's fine, or to both. Uh, so who wants, or to Jenny, or an, any of the other senior leaders. Jackie Brilling. Thank you, I would like to lob it to all three. <laughs> because I would like to ask, as we move forward with this strategic plan that may be on point or we, we amend as we go along, how would you envision from a shared governance perspective that we, the alumni, assist you as we move forward? You know, as, as I learned as a Chicago boy about voting, which was early and often, um, early, early and often, I mean, I think you should feel complete freedom, you as the leader of the Alumni Association, as its president, and everyone that you represent, to feel no hesitation to, to, to give us your observations. And, you know, it's, it's, a, um, it's a large group of alumni with 
different values, different views. Not everybody's going to agree with everything. Not everybody's going to understand anything. But I, I believe that um, all of the constituents of the school have to have an active voice and feel very comfortable and safe in exercising that voice. And uh, I, over the years, have constantly learned and borrowed from and um, and made decisions based on advice I've gotten from the graduates of the places that I've been a leader of. So that hope that doesn't sound too namsy pamsy in general. I, my, it, the invitation is very warm and very strong. Beth, I don't know if you have anything to add. Okay. <laughs> All right. I just want to say uh, thank you. Um, some of us here from uh, uh, that we came here in 1974, and that uh, we're the class of '77, the first official accredited. And uh, you know, here we are now, 45 years later. Say thank you because the thought that you know you live through it and adjust. Kind of what we were found on. See, when we got here, the most important thing is you had a check for seven hundred and fifty dollars. That was your um, interview process. <laughs> if you had that, you know you were in. Now it changed very quickly because we adjusted, and that there were times that we were two weeks close to not having enough money to pay. Faculty, but everybody adjusted. Why? Because we wanted to be here. So we weren't accepted in some other schools, and we wanted to be here. So we stuck to be here, but for the accreditation. So the reputation is what we have in our souls, not what others think. I just finished Thursday, 45 years of trying cases and teaching law. Because you gave us a chance. We stood up for the school, and the school stood up for us. So I thank you. I see you going through, but you're going to adjust, because we're fighters here. Hello. Um, I have a few interrelated questions, especially as I was one of the students who came in during a recession, and it looks like we're headed back in. And at 10 years, I'm still overloaded with student debt because I did very similarly come here. I wanted to be here, but moving from a life elsewhere is very expensive to come to this school. And we work in public interest, so we don't really make up the difference. Um, so my interrelated questions are about how many students are you hoping to enroll for the different programs? How much can the school actually take on for a student class? Um, I'm the class of 2012. We're the largest class. It was great. We started planning some things, and the classes after us shrunk, and that changed. And then also, um, as to the cost of living up here, are there discussions about affordable housing, living in a higher cost of living, and making it more affordable for students so they don't have to rely completely on very expensive loans going into the public interest. Thanks for that question. I'm gonna take your first question first. In terms of student debt, there's a couple of things that we're doing to try to help that situation, but by no means do we have a full solution. One thing is the online hybrid JD. That's gonna provide some opportunities for students to minimize their costs of getting a JD. Uh, first, because it's a part-time program, so students can work full-time during while achieving their degree. And second, because it's online, except for three brief residencies, students can avoid the relocation costs of coming here. So that's one way and one program that we think will result in lower uh, student debt per student. In terms of the numbers that we're estimating for admissions, we have 150 JD students estimated for this next year, with only modest growth from there. We're really still concerned about the bar passage, so we're really trying to keep that class as small 
um, although we would love to see more growth um, in the coming years. In terms of our master's programs as part of the new graduate school, we're estimating about 30 new students a year over time, which would add up to about 100 students. That is something that we might adjust, just as Rod suggested, as we start to implement the strategic plan and see where things land. But we made those estimates, which we thought were conservative, based on market research and, uh, and a comprehensive review of other programs. So that's where our numbers are. And I forget your third, the, oh, housing. I didn't really get to my watch list slide, but that was one of the things that I had on my watch list areas to watch because that's something Vermont Law School has been feeling extreme pressure on housing these last few years, really since the pandemic. I had never seen it like this before in my 11 years here. What happened was when we were virtual, the housing market exploded, which made the rental market explode. And all of the local landlords around here, not only did they have a really <laughs> A lot of demand, but they rented to, to not our students because our students weren't here. So when we returned to residential life, many of our students were unable to find apartments and unable to find affordable apartments. So that is one thing that we're looking at right now and that Rod will be helpful to us as we explore possibilities for on-campus housing. We have a couple of ideas, creative ideas on how we might make that work. We don't have any progress yet, but we're working on it. Another thing that we did last year is we contracted dorm space from VTC, which is right up the road at exit four. So we had about 15 students living in the dorms. It worked okay. We had some issues with COVID protocols, um, but that was at least one way for students to live with full amenities at their disposal without having to have a full apartment. Um, and that's how we also just help students um, get housing. But we know that it's a problem. We don't have all the solutions yet. Anything to add, Rod or Jenny? What is the current standing of certificate programs within the JD and where the, do they fall within the strategic plan? So we've changed our certificate programs to concentrations. We did that for reasons related to accreditation, but we still have concentrations, the ones that probably were here when you were here. Um, and we still have those and they'll still live in the JD program. We also have a pro professional certificate through our Center for Justice Reform. And we're fortunate to have Stephanie Clark here. I know she doesn't have the microphone, but could you just give a, a line or two about our professional certificates? Thank you, hi. Um, so yeah, we have a professional certificate in restorative justice. Um, it is uh, nine to 12 credits. Um, one of the things that's really nice about it is it really does borrow from our entire restorative justice curriculum, which is the most comprehensive restorative justice curriculum in the United States. We are the only master of arts in restorative justice at a law school in the United States, so we're very uniquely positioned. The other nice thing is that it's really got enough, um, the curriculum is deep enough that people that are interested can really tailor what it is that they have an interest in in restorative justice around that professional certificate. So law enforcement, social work, um, criminal justice, higher education, these are areas of, of um, lots of growth when it comes to restorative justice. So the professional certificate really offers that. Um, the other thing I'll say is that we were able to reduce the cost, so we were also able to increase access to that program, which is something that we're really committed to doing. So thank you. I also wanted to respond that um, in the graduate school, we're gonna be developing a number of non-degree credentials in various areas um, where we think that there's an appetite for that. So it could be certificates. The range of non-degree credentials that exists now is probably beyond your wildest dreams compared to even if you were getting your degree a few years ago. So that's something we're exploring. And then I also wanted to mention that we're developing um, an advocacy center that will be kind of a third branch apart from the two schools that will be offering non-degree training in advocacy skills like communications and development and lobbying and the kinds of things you need to know if you wanna do policy advocacy. Um, and that will be for career professionals or people who are wanting to enter into those careers. And so those will, those will also be the kinds of add-on trainings to help you specialize that will be available to everyone. So I have a question that kind of follows on that. So instead of cert certificates, what about CLE? Because I know that Vermont over the time, last few years has increased CLE with like our professors and stuff and can be accessed 
via the web and so online CLA. Can you talk about that? Because I don't know the, the most recent standing, and then I have a housing question, but first a CLE. Do you mean in terms of what CLEs we offer? Yeah, that people can access, like if I'm in North Carolina, I can take a CLE with a professor from Vermont Law School. Sure, so in the summer, um, in our environmental summer session, we have hot topics talks on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and each of those is worth one CLE credit. And I think we have like 11 or so over the summer. So you just pop in during lunch. Uh, it's, an, it's an hour long. Um, and for Ver a Vermont license, you just keep track of that on your own. And that's a pretty great way to rack up a bunch of credits. They're really interesting. They're on different um, you know, topical areas in environmental law, animal law, energy law, and things like that. Um, I know we offered a CLE yesterday. Um, it looks like Professor Sand has something to add. CLS is an approved <coughs> sponsor of CLA, CLA Country for Vermont, so if someone were to take a CLA, they at least in Vermont could claim. But other than the summer, are you guys doing it during the year? Because we were thinking, I think a few years ago when I was on the alumni board, we were looking at ways to make money for the school and having webinar, like full CLE, like credit, like 12 credits, 10 credits, was an idea that was being passed around. We haven't made much progress on that. One of our plans, though, with our greater, um, larger space in Burlington is to offer CLEs. That would be residentially, but it's something that we can easily do now that we're really becoming pros at hybrid delivery. So good idea. Another example of the alumni giving us good ideas to look at. <laughs> it was, I mean, it was something, I mean, I think about it five years ago, it's pre-pandemic, we were talking about it, and it was, I mean, it was more of a brainstorming how the school has a capability that can that we can pay for. You know, as a commodity, as alumni, we are interested in taking a CLE course by Professor Firestone, for instance, or one of the other professors from Vermont. So that was one idea. And then the other thing, just Beth, can you talk about this? Is, you know, tw 2002, we remember the Soro House where um, students lived. And so I don't remember, A, if we still own it, if the school still owns the Soro House, we sold it. Is that right? It doesn't look like it's being used. Is that something that could be in the future for the school? Uh, I'm looking at Lorraine because I'm sure she would say no. Uh, we did look at it. it it's not a... Um, I mean, if you have a shortage, right? I mean, I'm just... Uh, I, I the, don't the, think that building's in good shape. No, it was... A, so, we sold it about 10, 12 years ago to Pamela Goldstein. She sold it about three years ago. My understanding of it, it was supposed to be an artist community and a restaurant, and there's still, still rooms in there, and I think some of them are rented out, but... Um, that is long gone. I remember it fondly. Yeah. So. Uh, thanks for doing this. Um, and I just had a question. Sorry. Um, about the graduate program and how, what the plan is to you know build and attract faculty for some of that quantitative analysis, which I'm really excited to see as someone that works in policy and. That was kind of a gap here, so mm -hmm. excited to see that. Yeah, I, I'm already having some really exciting conversations with people about this. I mean, um, I won't name names, but there's someone at a very recognized institution that I've been trying to recruit. And um, just in talking about, you know, we have a new degree that has climate in the name, and this is someone who's very passionate about climate and has done exceptional work in climate policy on the quantitative side. So for people who are passionate about those issues, this is gonna be really exciting to them. Um, so I, my initial conversations have been really promising in that area, and we already have a lot of people here who have policy expertise, and so there's a certain amount that we will be able to deliver with what we have, but you point to an, a perfect example of where we do need to hire. Um, so I was uh, really in, um, enjoyed coming back and seeing the school after so many years, and the place is very important to me. So it was encouraging to hear that you know you're going to keep the law school in South Royalton, and I was wondering if you could spell, explain a little bit more how and why you made that decision. Um, and then secondly, uh, the strategic plan had a lot about the graduate school and the hybrid program, but not so much about the traditional residential law program here in South Royalton. So I was wondering if you could speak a little more to how that fits into the strategic plan. Yeah, so the, 
the decision to not move, uh, have a full relocation to Burlington was influenced dramatically by input from our community, faculty, staff, board members, and trustees. Um, and of course, we did look at potential spaces in Burlington um, and the cost of moving and relocating and um, whatever difficulties might flow from that. And we just decided it wasn't the best for our sustain to make a sustainable future for us, at least in the short term. So it really was a decision that had a lot of input from it. In fact, Stephanie Clark led a number of restorative justice circles for our internal community to talk about it and talk about the benefits and disadvantages of moving. The Board of Trustees had a number of discussions about it. We engaged several consultants to look at what it would cost and what it would likely bring to us and ultimately it just didn't make financial sense for us to make the move at this time. In terms of our residential JD, we believe that the strategic plan strengthens it by strengthening the overall reputation of the institution and providing a more sustainable future for us and more, um, and, and all of that just helps the reputation of the law school as well. But we continue to value our residential JD um, and we continue to make that a centerpiece of our campus life here. Um, so we anticipate that all of our JD students will be able to take classes in our, in our graduate school for JD credit as well. So there'll be lots of opportunities for cross-registration. Um, and then improving things like bar passage and all of that is very much a part of why we're doing the strategic plan in the first place. Something I'd like to add on the environmental side is I want to be really clear that we're not exporting the environmental program to the graduate school at all. The Environmental Law Center will continue to live in the law school. We will continue to have the premier environmental law school in the country. This is additive, what we're doing in the graduate school. So um, if anything, it, it will be adding opportunities, as Beth said, because there, there will be new things that law students will be able to add on. Last question. Right. Oh, well, Jackie's a, Jackie's a big player. <laughs> Can I? You want to go? There's no time for two. We have two questions. Yeah, I'll go. Then I'll try to condense the nonsense, because I had, I had actually a, a couple things. They're, and they're just follow-ups, and I haven't been back in a while, so please, any presumptions that I make. But something I'd like to see um, myself that maybe would help the school. I'm getting a sense, and I think a lot of us that were here, um, I was part of the Irene class. That was my thing. So I came here to Vermont from the New York City area. Uh, and that was a big adjustment lifestyle-wise. And then Irene, on top of it, was an extra big adjustment because the town kind of got ravaged and, you know, we were all in it together. And that was an interesting experience. It was like rural plus rural. Um, anyway, there are those of us that are, that are diehards and devotees for this experience, and we really like it. And when I hear the things about keeping it here, I hear the things about expanding the, the programs, but I'm also getting a sense that maybe there's a little tension philosophically and maybe this pandemic situation and the housing and have aggravated. I picked it up from a few people. It sounds like there's a little bit to me, again, it's an opinion, of sort of a town gown thing, maybe a little tension there. And what I'm thinking is, in, in addition, for those of us that love this place and those of us that want to be here as much as possible, another possibility that's kind of out there is that this pandemic has opened up a lot of remote opportunities. And a lot of people are working um, now in states for law firms and for themselves, and they're not necessarily where they are providing services anymore. Courts have switched to remote, clients are all over, people are licensed in many jurisdictions. Maybe there's a way down the road for the school to consider some sort of remote legal incubator. I'm just throwing out something I've been thinking about. A way for people that want to stay here, here in Windsor County in the Royalton area, to maybe stay after school, get their bar, and, op and work together in some sort of clinic type or not clinic or, or incubator or some kind of physical place because really they could stay and work anywhere. That's what the pandemic showed us and changed. I think a lot of people had that ability and maybe some of us want to stay here and maybe in the town gown sense, that's a way for the law school to maybe gain back some of the economic input into the town. If there was a big business here that was lawyers after and they didn't have to service Vermont people anymore, because we know there's a, there's a shortage, it's a small state, there's not an endless amount of clients, but people now work for people everywhere. So that was just a thought, you know, something I was thinking of. And the other thing was the CLE, just to kind of, this is the same kind of grain. The CLE process, getting, I'd love to get my CLE credits watching professors that I've loved and missed and everything else. Uh, as an out-of-state person who's not licensed in Vermont, I know a lot of the states have reciprocity. What's tough is the administrative part of that the follow-up, simple stuff like paperwork and sign-offs and you know, getting somebody to help you talk to your bar to make sure that the thing I took yesterday with Mr. Fair is usable in Jersey where it's a one-to-one, -one, you know, all I have to do is sign something. 
but it's not like that everywhere. And and the back end of it is hard for some of us because you know it's calling boards and attorney ethics and everything else. But it's definitely doable. Um, so that's it. Those are my thoughts. I took a lot of time. Some stuff about being here, you know, remote to use the remote after law school. That's what I'm thinking about. Great ideas, Jeff, and both the CLE one and the incubator one. I will say that I think town relationships have improved during the pandemic. I think the town really missed us when we were closed, um, and I think it, it resulted in a new appreciation for the, or at least a renewed appreciation for the law school that might have diminished over time. Um, and also, the town really didn't want us to move to Burlington. And so now that we are staying here, um, I think that there's a greater partnership between town. We're, at the same time, we're trying to expand our relationship and improve our relationship with the town by making sure to now that we're post pandemic continue to host events here on campus and in fact on July 25th we'll be having a candidate forum open to South Royalton residents as well for the um, for the candidates for Congress so we'll have a debate right here on campus that will be live streamed and members of the South Royalton community will be invited to attend so we're hoping to do more stuff like that as we emerge from the pandemic. Thank you for giving me the last question. <laughs> this is directed to the three of you again, Rod and Jenny and, and Beth. Um, with the uh, increase in the graduate school and the policy, sh the shift to policy uh, type courses, of course, I was the ethics officer for a state agency, so I'm. my question is, will there be amplification of ethics courses and, and an emphasis on ethics because of this shift in policy? Well, to the extent that you're speaking about professional ethics from a juris doctor perspective, I would say no, not in the graduate school, you know, because it's not, we're not focused on the judicial branch and the, and the practicing of law, but from an ethics perspective on the development of environmental policy for the environmental degrees, I would say absolutely. Um, the you know the racial justice focus, the equity focus. Everyone's going to be required to take an environmental justice class if they're getting an environmental degree. Um, I think will absolutely enhance that. And in the for the Master of Arts in Restorative Justice, um, I I don't know if you guys want to say anything about the ethics aspect of your curriculum. Yeah, actually, so I, I um, one of the classes I developed and teach is ethics and restorative justice, and certainly professionalism and being grounded in the principles, um, you know, of, of what it means to be a professional, what it means to be restorative, is is grounded in every, every course that we teach. Um, so that's deeply steeped in our curriculum. I should say, too, that, that all of our master's students will be taking a um, a non-credit module in professionalism as the, one of the very first things they do before they start their master's degree. So that will be really baked in there too. So we are at time. I would like to thank everyone for your attention and participation. Great questions. We're all, uh, all the administrators and employees are gonna be around for the barbecue, which is the next event on the calendar. Uh, if you're in a milestone class, then you'll have your class pictures, make a plug for the alumni award ceremony at two o'clock, and then some ice cream to end the day. So um, thank you all so very much.